Welcome to the very first episode of Declassify. And firstly, thank you so much for choosing to come and tune in. I have the great pleasure of introducing our first guest. Some of you have probably heard of her music before, and in fact, I'm quite familiar with all of her work, having also studied with her during my time at the Sydney Conservatorium. I'd like to welcome on board academic and composer Felicity Wilcox. Felicity, who currently lectures at the University of Technology, Sydney, is a prolific interdisciplinary composer who has written for a range of ensembles through the The Concert Hall, but most notably, she is an accomplished and award-winning screen composer. Beyond this, she is a remarkably proactive advocate for gender equity and diversity in music in Australia. In fact, for four years from 2017, she was the chair and co-founder of the Gender Equity Committee of the Australian Guild of Screen Composers. So welcome onto the podcast, Felicity. Thanks, Vicky. Well, I thought a good place for us to start our conversation would be to talk about your start, which was back in the 80s. You started working and training as a composer then. What was it like and how has it changed since? Well, I was really naive. I started at about the age of 20 and I was lucky that my mum was making documentaries and hired me onto one of her productions. And at the time I was studying composition in a fairly patchwork kind of way at um, Sydney University. So I was studying an arts degree with a music major and sort of wangling my way into composition shoots with people like Peter Sculthorpe and Eric Gross. After about a year and a half, this opportunity with my mum came up and so I pitched for that and she and the editor thought they'd give me a go. And I really took to it like a duck to water. It just felt natural to me to um, compose music for Image. And it was only a few years later. I, I was getting quite regular work after a few years with independent filmmakers working at the ABC and SBS. And I was accepted into an internship with Peter Miller at Meaningful Eye Contact, which was a studio that made ads, essentially, really high-end ads, and video clips for bands like In Excess and Crowded House. The ads that I worked on with Peter taught me a lot because Peter had... He had a, an Atari with Cubase version 1 on it <laughs> and, and an Akai S1000 sampler and um, this was about 1990, 1991. By that stage, I dropped out of uni. I didn't finish that degree. I was just working a lot in studios and doing film soundtracks and interning on ads... Then after about two years with Peter, I decided I'd just try and, you know, get my own studio happening and get my own um, work. And that coincided with getting my first feature film. So that was at about the age of 26. I composed the score for Redheads by a director called Danny Vendramini. The film itself didn't go so great. It didn't get any huge accolades as a film, but I was nominated for an AFI award for my soundtrack and that was in 1992 and I was the first woman ever to be nominated for um, Best Feature Score in Australia. So I made a little bit of history there. I didn't win but I was proud to be nominated. And then I just kind of worked solidly really until um, 2010. Yeah, and in 2010 I flipped over into more academic focus and concert music. So that's my start. But how it, how it has changed, oh my goodness. You know, I would walk in the 80s, so when I was first starting out, it was the late 80s. I was just a girl in studios. There were never any other women in studios unless they were the musician's girlfriends. You know, I would routinely be asked to make coffee in the middle of my own sessions by males in the studio who felt that I would, must be the coffee girl, otherwise why would I be there? I would get comments about my skirts, you know, my hair, my legs, my music. All I wanted was that they would take my music seriously. If I ever actually had a real conversation with someone about my music, I felt really honoured. shouldn't have been like that. That just should have been a given. The, the people that did take me seriously, so the people that I met at Trackdown Studios... I've had an association with those people for over 30 years. But they took me seriously and they, they could hear my music and they understood that I had talent and that I was worth supporting. So on the one hand, there were always, you know, typical blokey blokes who would tend to put you down and objectify you 
And then on the other hand, there were, you know, really wonderful men who took me seriously and gave me opportunities and mentored me. I didn't really get a lot of mentoring from women. It was mainly men because I just didn't really know any other women who were doing soundtracks at that time. I met some collegially, so Sharon Calcroft, Jan Preston. I did go along to the Screen Composer Guild meetings back then, but I felt so intimidated by the sheer numbers of men and the attitudes of the men. Studio culture was very, very gendered, and it still is, but I think 30 years ago it was unapologetically biased, whereas now it's probably more unconscious bias that women face from men. It was just conscious bias. I mean, they're probably less likely to say things like that out loud or to your face now. Although it does happen occasionally, it probably won't be to the same extent that you were experiencing in the 80s. Right. And you can call it out now. You know, you can say, hey, that's not appropriate. Whereas if you'd done that, like if I'd done that in the 80s, it just would have been all lighten up. You know, now at least there's a conversation that people are actually having to engage in, whereas you were just dismissed, you know, don't make a fuss. And I was so desperate to fit in because I was the only woman wherever I was that I just didn't make a fuss, you know. If I was asked to make coffee, I'd just go make coffee. Exactly. And you have an option in that particular scenario of either maintaining your professionalism or standing up for yourself. And you never want to be put in the position where you feel like you're starting a scene. Although this particular environment you were working in was 30, 40 years ago. So I'd I'd like to think that it's changed. It's a different, it is a really different world. And I, you know, I feel that women still have a long way to go in terms of representation. But in terms of the things that we allow men to get away with now, it's much less. You know, we've really come out of the shadows in terms of claiming our space and finding our voice and it's still not perfect. But again, you know, all I can do is compare it to when I was 20 and it's just so much easier to be taken seriously as a woman now. There are so many more opportunities targeted for women now and hopefully in another 25 years we're going to get to a point where that those things aren't necessary because representation will be equal but we're still very much at the beginning of that journey. But at least we've started on the journey and I'm actually proud to have been part of that. Well, you've been a significant part of it because not only were you attending the meetings, but since then you've taken on this very proactive role of being an advocate for the Screen Guild. It's been, it was four years, wasn't it? Well, I actually founded the Gender Equity Committee of the Screen Composers Guild and contrary to what you said, I disengaged from meetings with the Guild in the late 80s because I felt intimidated, I felt objectified, I I didn't ever feel comfortable. Despite that, you know, I did win awards and I was nominated for awards and I'd go for the odd, you know, ceremony. But as far as actually being involved in committees and things, I really disengaged. And then in 2015, I just kind of went, you know what, I've got a, I looked at the stats, they were still terrible. Um, There were a couple of women who were kicking goals but hardly any and I went this hasn't changed in you know nearly 30 years I've got to do something about it or I'm going to die and there will be women being locked out still and I just you know I had I have a daughter and she was about 14 at that time and I just went no I'm going to do something. So I went back to, I I got myself elected onto the board on the platform of really addressing gender equity. And already on the board were Caitlin Yeo and Yantra de Vilda. They both shared my passion for this cause. And when I said, look, I'm I'm actually going to implement most of the, the things I put on the table are going to be gender focused. They said, we'll support you. And so I came up with the idea to run a roundtable, our first gender equity roundtable in 2016. The president at the time was Guy Gross and he knew that change needed to happen as well. Guy and I have been in the industry for about the same amount of time and Guy had watched the glacial pace of change and was as keen as I was to get things started. We convened a industry roundtable on gender equity. We had a really packed boardroom at APRA and um, we had about three hours of discussion and a lot of what came out was just women's testimonials, just like the stories I've just told you, just women, women saying the same thing over and over, young women, older women, 
middle-aged women. And we realised that, you know, there were some really systemic problems and there was a real glass ceiling because of those systemic problems in place for women. And so what it did was really galvanise us to invest more time and effort into that, into improving things. And we were lucky in that at around the same time, APRA commissioned a survey um, with lead researcher Catherine Strong. And so she produced a report in 2017 that's a really, really, I guess, damning document in terms of looking at how the screen industry functions. And what that did was it gave us empirical data that really matched the anecdotal data that came out both through the roundtable but also we knew through our lived experience as female composers. Um, And so we had this really nice sort of anecdotal and um, qualitative and quantitative data set. And then from there I've taken work through the Guild, um, advocacy work. Um, After that roundtable, Yantra, me and Caitlin, along with Amanda Brown, set up the Gender Equity Committee of the... AGSC and we went about implementing some initiatives that I think have made quite a big difference. The report you mentioned before from 2017 by Dr Strong and Dr Canizo, I was having a little read through it and they make a point that the amount of women who were registered on the APRA platform itself in terms of membership at that time it was only 21.7%. So we're starting off from a basis in which there aren't many women who choose this profession to begin with. And some of the strategies around encouraging women have got to do with mentorship and initiatives and programs as such. In fact, I saw some information recently about quite an important mentoring program that you yourself have been part of setting up. Yeah, yeah. So we set up the, um, along with APRA's help, we set up the APRA AGSC Screen Music Mentorship. It's an annually awarded paid film music mentorship for women and non-binary composers. So that's been going now since 2017, I believe. No, we set it up in 17 and we rolled it out in 18. So 18, 19 and 20. And I'm, you know, really proud of that because the composer is paid a $4,000 fee and they get to, over six months, work really closely with a more senior composer. Last year, I I collated a lot of resources for women and non-binary composers which are housed on the AGSC website. We set up a dedicated webpage about gender equity which contains an acknowledgement, a mission statement and that's a really strong presence for um, the Guild. We also tied in with APRA to make sure that the AGSC um, APRA Screen Music Awards have um, at least 40% female representation for all judging panels and the same quota for female speakers and performers at the ceremony. And I don't know if this is coincidental or not, but after those quotas were implemented, it aligned with a significant upswing in female award recipients in 2017. <laughs> Sadly, though, that did dip actually last year. So in 17, 18 and, nine, and 17 and 18, the female award recipients were you know, more than double what they had been. And then last year they dipped back again to a disappointing low. For those of you who don't know, APRA is quite an important organisation. In Australia, they're essentially the organisation that represents uh, and supports creators, songwriters and composers uh, through their platform. So APRA is the Royalties Collection Society for Music in Australia. That's their main function. And then as a result of that, they're a not-for-profit organisation. They're all about supporting creators, supporting music creators to to create more and create better and to bring in more revenue. In terms of um, statistics for female screen composers, I'll just give you some percentages. So the percentage of women out of all earning members in the area of audiovisual music in the calendar years from 2015 to 2019, so across those five years, sit at around 11%. So in 2015, it was 11.09% and in 2019 it was 11.73%. So that is the percentage of 
all composers working in audiovisual music who identify as female. And that's pretty bad. Over the last five years, in terms of royalties earnings, it's even worse. So the composers who have earned over $2,000 in annual royalties, which isn't a lot. It's sort of like you don't have to be working very hard to earn over $2,000 in annual royalties. The percentage of those composers earning two thousand in annual royalties who identify as female average just 7.83 percent over five years so we're really sitting at a very low number looking at what happened in the in the academy awards this year when hilda godner dottia won um the mm. best score for joker she was just the third woman to win that individual Oscar for Best Score in its 85-year history. The, what that does is is it translates to women going, and men actually going, women can't compose screen music. They're not good at it, you know. They can't, they can't do it well enough to get to that top level. To the girls, to the women, to the mothers, to the daughters who hear the music bubbling within, Please speak up. We need to hear your voices. And so those things are borne out by, you know, statistics like in the USA in 2018, women comprised just 6% of composers working on the top 250 grossing films. So do you think that the initiatives that have been opening up including the mentorship program that you've been a part of setting up all through to music education programs and competitions that are aimed towards women are going to help change the landscape or normalize us seeing women in these particular roles of creating music for screen and for the stage i think they're a slow burn solution uh, and i think they do normalize as you say and i think they amplify women they fast track emerging composers and women who might need to re-engage with industry. It, they, those mentorships fast track that process. They foster a more inclusive culture in screen composition, which all of which is great. But part of the problem, you know, part of the reasons why women aren't getting cut through and working in those really high high end areas, Catherine Strong's research corroborated what we knew as screen composers which is that most women get stuck in documentary and I'm an example of that, you know. I worked for years and years and years on really high-end docos, feature doc documentaries, documentary series. Someone like Caitlin Yeo largely does the same and, and has spoken about that as well. Amanda Brown's in the same position. Yes, they get feature films here and there. We, we all sort of bust out occasionally into drama but, you know, very much a glass ceiling and the reason is because... Documentary tends to be lower budget, so it's lower stakes. Where you get those high budget productions, those high prestige produ productions, they tend to go to the same men. A and it seems to circulate around these men that are tried and true, they've got track record, they've got umpteen examples of working at that level. And so it really begs the question is, how do women break through that glass ceiling and get counted in that very limited number, you know, when it is such a risk averse industry? And so these are the conversations that need to, you know, we really need to have. And it's not really viable to kind of just appeal to, you know, film producers better natures and say, well, take a punt on this woman, she's great. It sadly doesn't work that way. And there are a few initiatives in the screen industry where they've been able to shift numbers because it's the same for female directors, producers and writers – those percentages have traditionally been really low as well. And it's the same problem, you know, how do you get women into those higher profile productions? And what Gender Matters, Screen of Scratch Australia's Gender Matters initiative has done is to attach funding to quotas which mandate that of the four key creative roles, so that's lead actor, writer, director and producer, three of those four roles have to be female, occupied by female um, workers in order to attract funding and so they've tied funding to gender quotas. Another screen industry that did that really effectively was in Sweden uh, led by Anna Serna. They've also been doing that in um, Berlin, a um, 
10% for 50-50. So under that scheme, the production and post-production and facility houses and other service providers who've signed up offer a 10% rebate to projects that can demonstrate a gender balance. So these funding sort of, you know, attaching gender quotas to funding has, has been really effective in those lead roles, in those key creative roles. Sadly, what we were hoping as screen composers was that there would be a trickle-down effect to composers and if you had a female director, she would hire a female composer. Well, we've tracked the data across the last five years and there has not been a shift. So Gender Matters was implemented in 2015. In 2018, they did tracking that found that um, there'd been a, a vast improvement in the numbers of um, key creative roles that were occupied by women and it has not translated to an upswing in um, in, comp- in composers. So it's a double-edged sword, you know. It's about giving women the skills. It's about giving women um, more networks. And I think the mentorships do that. It's about normalising female part- participation. It's about amplifying talented women, spotlighting them. And I think it, the mentorships do that. But until we probably need to implement really targeted and aggressive initiatives that collate female composers and and money, you know, um, I don't think we're going to get more women being placed into productions anytime soon. We need targeted and specific initiatives to urgently improve our representation. So herein comes the devil's advocates question, especially when I'm trying to research this topic and I've come across a lot of the same criticism when it comes to anything that is quota based. A lot of people say that other people should be hired by skill and that it's tokenistic of otherwise. I mean, I can't actually think of any other method in which we can shift a system so that different people of different genders or identify with different genders other than being male will be able to be represented. With a lot of the conversations I've been having with a lot of different people all through classical music, from screen to stage, there isn't really an acknowledgement of sexism or the nuances of sexism or that the perception of certain people, for example women, aren't capable of producing higher scaled works. So without a quota based system, particularly initially to push representation, I can't imagine how this larger shift would happen because you're right. Relying on the good graces of producers or directors or conductors is not going to create a change in the culture. Yes, so what you're talking about is the meritocracy argument, you know, which is completely flawed. How can you judge a meritocracy when you're excluding vast swathes of the population? You know, when there are systemic barriers to be passed through before minorities and women even get a look in how can you talk about a meritocracy how can you talk about quality and in fact I think opening up the field to minority composers to non-binary composers to female composers increases the meritocracy because it lets people in it lets it allows for a wider variety a greater number of practitioners which is going to increase the pool which is going to make it more competitive which is going to mean that the really talented people rise to the top as opposed to the same middle-aged old white men (laughs) rising to the top time and time again so I actually think the meritocracy argument is a total furphy And I think it plays very conveniently into a power base that wants to maintain the status quo. And also there's a problem with the argument in that a lot of the people who are trying to get into the industry through these uh, different initiatives or quota-based systems, they already have the stigma of not being good enough for that role because we haven't seen people like that doing that role over and over again through history. So if you don't have that system, they won't even get a foot through the door. Exactly. There's actually a a really good initiative called the Institute for Composer Diversity. They talk about, it's, it's worth having a little look at, the director, Rob Diemer, writes, it seems that there's a ceiling of three to eight diverse composers per season. This is for orchestras. Irrespective of how many works there are in the season, my guess is that there's a perception issue here. Folks see a handful of composers who aren't white men in a program and think that's enough. So there's kind of like a, you know, diversity box, I guess, that gets ticked. And also, you know, they'll pick the same 
few women or the same few black composers or the same few, you know they'll they'll rotate and and I notice in Australia we have certain women that get picked time and time again whenever we're showcasing female composers. So Dima writes, if every orchestra we've looked at limited the number of works by a single composer to two, there would be over 200 slots amongst 35 orchestras that would have opened. So it's this idea that we need to share the benefit around and not just constantly pick the same elite men or the same elite one or two women or the same elite one or two composers of colour, you know. We actually need to consciously go out and seek new voices. And I ran a concert series, a house concert series in my in my home for a while and um, I'll be doing it again after COVID. Um, and I would find, you know, one of the one of the mandates for the programming was 50%, you know, gender split and, you know, inclusive of non-binary too. Performers would come and say, oh, but all the works I know are by men. And I'm like, well, sorry, go and find one by a woman because we've actually got ten works and so far seven are composed by men, so we need another two composed by women. And when it was a simple numbers thing, it actually forced the performers to go out and find works that they liked that were composed by women or non-binary composers and then to learn a new piece. And guess what? That opened up their repertoire to my more diverse composers. It's about being intentional and it's, you know, like this whole argument of it's lowering the standard. It's actually just lifting up the rocks and looking underneath the rocks at the talent that's been lying there and sitting there all along and has just never had the spotlight. Just as a brief intermission to our conversation about gender equity and diversity, here is a small excerpt of some of Felicity's most recent music, her 2018 string quartet, Secrets Through a Sound Glass, performed by Son Ombra.
In fact, I have a fun little anecdote for this from when I was in high school. And for anybody else who was from New South Wales, you had to do the HSC, which for music has the Australian music component in it for the examination. And so I had to learn Australian repertoire with a focus on contemporary repertoire from the last 25 years. And it was actually in that course that I was introduced to Lisa Lim for the first time. And it was for a piece for solo cello called Invisibility. I had never heard of her before that point, And I'd never realized that there was quite a high profile Australian and Asian woman who was producing music for orchestra and chamber music. And I was kind of surprised because it was that year that I was more comfortable with letting people around me know that this is what I was choosing to pursue as a career. And to see another person doing something like that, something that I thought was sort of impossible for me, and to be able to relate to that was really important. And it was in that moment I realized how profoundly important representation was, that there was someone who existed in this scene who was doing really well and that I could aspire to do the same thing. So without that series or history of women working in this industry... It's the, if you, you can't be it if you can't see it. Yes, exactly. You see that it's, it's possible. And, you know, to, to your question about what was it like in the 80s, there were, there were no other women around. The you know, black, white, Asian, there were just no women, you know. So, so to see another woman doing it was really inspirational. But if we don't have, um, if we can't see ourselves successful or people like us, why would we attempt that career path, right? And, and so these are the really structural issues that I actually did want to talk through. You know, these are part of why we're not represented in, in higher numbers. Factors that contribute to gender disadvantage, and this is specifically in screen music, but I suspect that it's across most genres of music, are the disproportionate share of childcare that falls to women in the screen industries. What we found in screen music is that because there's no structure, and this is the same for most freelance composers, there's no industry kind of structure around parental support. And a survey done by WIFT, Women in Film and Television, revealed that 85% of primary carers identify as female. So that really puts the burden of childcare back onto women. And particularly in screen composition where you have crazy deadlines, really late nights, um, no rhythm to the work, um, an expectation that you're available 24-7 and you can deliver everything yesterday. How does a woman manage without significant support from a partner. Not all women have that. In fact, my career, I'd just actually been nominated for two AFI awards. So I was really writing at the top of my game and then my marriage ended and I found myself a single mother of a four-year-old and an eight-year-old and I really had to make a decision. I had started my PhD but I really had to make a decision about whether I could physically deliver as a screen composer, you know, whether there were just enough hours in the day and enough hands to help. And I decided there weren't. And that's when I stepped out of screen composing as my main focus and decided that I would have to focus on an academic career that gave me more support and more stability in order to function as a single mother. And so these are not family-friendly industries. And until we've also seen a lot of women dropping off mid-career, so they'll sustain exactly the same pattern I had. They'll sustain very positive careers as as pre-children. And then when they have children, they'll be building and then suddenly they'll be out of the game. When we look at the numbers of senior women, they're really few and far between. So women over 50 are really poorly represented in screen music. And a lot of uh, older women have just decided to go into other areas of work. And that is a very big part of why the glass ceiling remains in place. Just at the point where our male peers are ascending into, you know, the top echelons of the industry, the women are are falling falling out and falling behind. So we really need to address childcare and support for carers and parents. Obviously, there's still sexist attitudes and sexual harassment that disrupt women's well-being and career advancement. As we agreed, they're now less acceptable than they were a generation ago, which is, you know, one of the good things that Me Too has resulted in. We are now able to call that stuff out. But that is still there and we still hear it reported by women. The other thing is the question of gatekeepers. So studio executives, film producers, directors, music producers, agents, publishers 
conductors, orchestra board members, um, curators, um, still tend to be largely male. The board members in the major MPAs are still overwhelmingly... Chairs of boards are still overwhelmingly male in Australia. So Opera Australia, MSO, those, those kinds of big... MPAs, males still outnumber females on boards and chairs of boards and artistic directors still tend to be male. So these are the gatekeepers that are making programming decisions and unless they're thinking intentionally about bringing female creators in and and programming women's music, it's not going to happen. So we need women in leadership roles and in gatekeeping positions. Back to orchestras though, I mean orchestras, it's a bit of a double whammy because a lot of orchestras aren't programming living composers' work. So for starters, you know, it's hard for any living composer to have their work programmed. But then on top of that, women are very poorly represented among those living composers. Looking at the 2018 to 19 orchestral season across 15 orchestras worldwide, just 2.3% of the compositions programmed were by women. So that means 97.7% were by men. And the stats in 2020 were hardly improved on that. So that, that's research done by Donne in Musica, which are a British collective that are compiling statistics and, and looking really closely at the orchestras and holding orchestras to account for their programming. Well, orchestras are a, a special one because I remember at the beginning you were talking about there's a difference between doing work for documentaries and for feature films. And I, if we kind of draw a comparison, I suppose orchestral repertoire could be kind of the feature film of the classical music industry on stage. There's a huge reluctance in taking or what's perceived as taking a financial risk in not only commissioning new music but new music from a woman. It's really high stakes, yeah. There's, there's bigger forces, bigger budgets, more musicians, bigger concert halls, all of that. And opera's about the worst as well. And, and I mean, just despite there being a really great new movement now to be more gender and culturally inclusive in opera, you know, led by people like Sally Blackwood and um, and I believe Lisa Lim and Peggy Polias are, are working with her, you know, in this area too. So there's been a conversation about that that's really come through in the last two years, which is great. But, you know, I've just got some stats in front of me. In 2018, Opera Australia Productions featured just 4.7% women in key creative roles. So that's not just composer, but it's conductor and director as well. And in 2019, this did improve to 15%, obviously because there was a targeted focus on the issue. And the New York Metropolitan Opera between 1880 and 2016, that is its first 136 years, programmed just one opera by a woman. So of the 27 operas in its 2018-19 season, including several new productions, so new original commissions by living composers, 0% were composed by women. So we really need to look at those appalling percentages and and ask ourselves why. Why in 2020 is this allowed to continue? Are we not calling it out from the rooftops and saying enough is enough? It's time. It's time we held men to account for for these incredibly limiting programming choices that they're making. And it's just not fair. I'm in my 50s now and I'm sick of it. It's just not fair. So that's why I do all the advocacy work I do because I have to do something, you know. Well, it's it's necessary because the first step is to have a conversation and then to have procedures in place and then to see if there's a result. Obviously, it seems glacial to us, but I think the work you've been doing has been pushing for a change. I've found even in the four years I've been doing this leading advocacy and, and being loud about it on social media, I, I'm getting less trolling. Initially, whenever we'd stick our heads out and say something, you know, within the guild, we'd get trolled and someone would shoot us down. And you'd say it's changed since then? It's normalising slowly, you know. It would be really nice if mm-hmm. if I could get lots and lots of likes from male peers. It's that whole thing about giving up power and it's confronting when you've had power to be challenged to relinquish it. And this goes to white composers opening up the way to composers of colour, women opening up to non-binary. My take on all of that is intersectionality. 
we can't complain about being excluded if in our turn we then exclude. I don't lose anything by spotlighting a composer with a disability, for example. It doesn't take anything away from me if I do that. The same with being inclusive, you know, people of colour, Indigenous composers. Bring it on because what it is doing to me is breaking down these really, the hegemony, you know, the bastions of power. And if we can just, you know, change all that up and and bring in more diverse voices, it's going to be a much more interesting scene. I think so too, to look at how the industry as a whole is living because if the people who are creating the works or hold the power are not as representatively diverse as their audience, there might be over time a breaking down of connections or the kind of narratives that we will be able to express. Well, exactly. And it also goes to we want art that is like the world we live in. And if I'm looking around and seeing composers like Liza Lim and yourself... Brenda Gifford, people that are that I see when I walk down the street. <laughs> I want those voices. I, I want to understand what those stories are. I, I want to hear what people that aren't like me have to say. I want to hear my own stories echoed through the voices of other women in music. I want those diverse stories and sounds. I mean, the project that you're doing with the Vietnamese drum is amazing because... Otherwise, I wouldn't have heard about that, <laughs> you know. Like, got it. We've got to hear this diversity of stories, particularly in Australia, because we are such a multicultural country. When I get resistance to this from male peers, or or worse, neutrality, you know, men just not saying anything, not standing with you, not clapping their hands, not engaging because they're scared. They're scared to enter into a conversation where they don't feel they are allowed to have a voice maybe and maybe that's what it is but I I find it dispiriting because I would rather they spoke up and had a conversation with me and acknowledged that they were scared because they didn't know how to handle this conversation ask questions and offer support share some of your limelight where you possibly can program a female composer or a culturally diverse composer or an indigenous composer And it's just like sharing the love around, really. So I feel it's really sad when men feel berated or chastised or silenced. And part of what I've tried to do with advocacy work, I've been doing for gender equity in music, and I've been doing that internationally for the last two years, is not to confront, not to not to be confronting, but to be embracing and to be inclusive of men. And if they ask how they can help, to tell them how they can help. Not to tell them, to scold them, you know, not to say you're terrible. And and I think there's a real um, constructive dialogue that we can have with male gatekeepers and leading male musicians and leading male composers that doesn't sideline them, that just shows them that it's about pulling together to, to create art that is more representative of the world in which we live. I think that's really at the heart of it well, at the heart of representation and diversity is that we're hoping to engage with people on a wider base through the stories that we can tell. And, I mean, I'm glad we're having this conversation now because it kind of hones in on the point that diversity, whether it's through gender or cultural diversity and how different industries tackle this question of representing women and people of colour Diversity shouldn't be perceived as a threat. And we were talking before about the stats and how in orchestral programming, the amount of women that are represented is just under 3%. And know what you're advocating for is complete equal representation being 50-50. And that seems like a long way off for orchestral programming where it's just about just under 3%. So basically the initiatives that are set up in that particular strain in classical music, being concert music or orchestral music, I would love to see that double. So really in the next year to three years to see that 2.8% become something like 5%. That would be amazing. It's still shockingly low. But what you said before about it being sad that there's a lack of engagement from people who feel really threatened by this, honestly, number-wise, minuscule change to the landscape as a whole. We require these really small, minuscule changes through initiatives like programs for women and women mentoring programs in order to even shift 
a 1% change in the landscape. It's really important that we have these initiatives because without them, that tiny change in which to normalise a profession that is an art form, so an audience sees this representation of our society on stage, it won't change without these little steps here and there that will result in a cumulative effort. And, and that we can't do it on our own. We need men to help us. We need people in power to help us and, and to stand with us and to, to promote us and um, facilitate networking for us, you know, and to offer us pathways to put initiatives in place, to include us in conversations, to put us in boardrooms, to put us at the table, um, to champion us. We, we need that. I kind of need the realisation that the idea of diversifying anything, either through the creative base or people um, who are at the table, as you say, it doesn't mean that there is a narrowing of the power. Because I think some people have the perception that if we change it too quickly or if we kind of give roles out to different people all at once, that somehow the power base is narrowed. Whereas I think it's widening the stories. And as you say, we're sharing the love rather than potentially some people feeling like they're losing the power that they had for so long. We're sharing it, not stripping it away. Yeah, and I haven't met one woman who or one non-binary composer or one culturally diverse composer who wants to, you know, dominate and steal the limelight off everybody else. It's more about let's just do stuff and let's include each other and let's share the love. <laughs> yeah, exactly, as you say. One thing I'm fr- a bit, little bit frustrated by is um, the lack of, data about non-binary musicians and non-binary composers. Um, I've recently edited a book about screen composers, female identifying screen composers, and we do include trans composers in that. One thing that I found frustrating was that there was a lack of empirical data about that discrete cohort. Um, There's data about, you know, that lumps women and non-binary composers in together you know, data that excludes non-binary and and focuses on women. So one thing I'm really keen to do, and I'm hoping that I get to do this through my um, research in my university role, is to actually get discrete data sets for non-binary composers in art music so we can find out who's doing what and what their scenes are and, you know, who's involved in those scenes and is there any common ground between a kind of an art music practitioner who is non-binary and an art music practitioner who identifies as female and I just want to understand that world better as a as a focus and hopefully I think with the dialogue opening up around non-binary individuals and with that community really claiming their identity now um, publicly um, I'm hoping that we're now going to spotlight that group and bring that group in into this discourse around gender diversity because gender equity and diversity isn't just about a binary female male composer base it's if we talk about gender diversity, we've also got to look at all the all the expressions of gender that lie in between those two binaries. And, and important in understanding the diversity of diversity. Right, because, you know, yes, biologically sort of cisgendered women have a specific set of concerns and issues and life experience. There's no doubt about that. So do trans women. So do non-binary women. So do trans men. You know, it's... So let's try and understand a little bit better. Let's not minimise somebody's identity and say you're not a woman because you're not cisgendered. So I think these conversations are really interesting. I think they're really yielding fascinating um, depth and detail and nuance and I'm glad that we're having them. And I'm really glad that I'm having this conversation with you. I remember studying with you and you were already at the Guild at the time and you were talking about some of the advocacy then and it was really amazing for me to see at the time. It was when I was first starting out in composition. It was 2015, I think, I studied with you. So it kind of coincided. Yes, I had, so I just started, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Actually, that year I had gone to study composition in summer school at the Gondwana National Summer School, and they have that little composition course. It's funny, you mentioned childcare before, and that year there was one of the composition mentors who was male, Uh, at one point in one of our little classes turned to the girls in the class and asked us about whether or not we were considering having children 
and how that would change our creative process because his wife had been a writer and it altered everything for her having children. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I was 19. I never thought of that before. Wow. Mm. And that he could ask you so immune to the problem. <laughs> we find that like Caitlin and I, Caitlin Yeo and I were sitting at one of the awards. These guys got up and they, they picked, they claimed their award and the first thing they did as they clutched their trophies was they thanked their wives who they never see for keeping the home fires burning while they're in the studio day in, day out. <laughs> Caitlin and I just looked at each other and rolled our eyes and just went, we hate that. It's just saying it's okay for men to delegate the childcare and to make it a female problem or a, w- a wives problem. Where are our wives? Who's doing that for us? And it really does just explain why women are being locked out, why women aren't getting to those top levels. We need to question the assumption that men have that women will do that work. And fortunately, the younger men I talk to, like men in their 30s, are now going, well, we know we have to pull our weight and, you know, we know it's not fair to let our wives do that. And and there really is much more awareness of that. But I think they're still in the minority And I would say I think they're the first generation of men who are actually really taking that on board. It's sad that that guy was sort of feeling so entitled to to ask you what you ladies were going to do when you had children because it's all your problem. It was a really odd moment. And I remember thinking vividly about Virginia Woolf's A Room of One Zone, where she talks about the experience of being a woman and of being a creative woman. One of the key quotes being, a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write. And it really brought forth this idea of balancing your home and your creative working life because she goes into depth about balancing the responsibilities of requiring financial independence and time. Lots of time away from domestic duties in order to produce the work. And that was all the way back in the late 1920s. So it's been a long time coming. And for a second little intermission is a second piece written by Felicity Wilcox in 2016 called People of This Place. Felicity Wilcox would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation to whom this piece is dedicated and pays respect to all Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging as the traditional custodians of the land that inspired it. She also wishes to thank the performer Jason Noble whose contribution was invaluable.
one of the things I'm doing now is I'm on the advisory board to Raising Films Australia and that's an initiative brought out from the UK by women in film and television here in Australia. And so Raising Films Australia is looking at this issue of caring and, you know, the, the vast responsibility falling still to women and trying to bring in more structural support in the screen industry for carers. And so it's not just women with children and men with children, you know, primary carers. It's also people who are caring for disabled partners or parents or elderly parents or, you know, whatever. So bringing, you know, things like creche, like film shoots, having creches on set. I'm trying to get them to think about post-production and how women, composers, sound editors, people involved in post can get a bit more support for the long hours that we're required to put in. So that might be something for composers more generally to think about. Given that a lot of us have to compose around our day jobs, that often involves night time, dinner time, weekends. How do we get those supports in place so that our children are being looked after or so that we're able to still have the families that we want to have? And I think that's a really big question and, and I really think it goes to the glass ceiling effect. There's no point in giving emerging women and young women all this support to come into industry if at 30, 35, 40, we're going to lose their talent. So I think women of all ages and career stages need to be supported. I think that's, you know, what we really need to address to see more women leading of, of you know, of any culture, of any, of any colour, you know, um, non-binary, cisgendered or otherwise, you know, we need to see more women at the top because they are the inspiring leaders that our field is really lacking. Of course, we need collegiality amongst entry level and emerging level, mid-career level. We need numbers of women in at those levels too. But we really need to see more women right at the top, I think. I suppose I have an anecdote for that. It's not related to music, but it relates to this idea of the glass ceiling, which, as we know, is everywhere in society, in every possible field. Uh, in your home to professional work. There was an interview of um, Melinda Gates and she talks at length about two aspects of gender equality. Firstly, it has to start in the home. If you have equality in the home in terms of duties, domestic duties and child caring, you both have the chance now in a contemporary society to pursue your individual careers because women are no longer tied to the home as they were in the 50s. And then she talks about the workplace and her example being that if the investor or the people at the table or the people at the top or the board are not a diverse range of people, there will be a significant disconnection between them and what they're trying to produce, whether it be music, creative output or selling a product. And her key example was that she had herself invested into a business that was owned by an African-American woman. And I believe it was for a certain type of hair extension, which is a big market in America. However, the story of this woman was that she had previously approached several other high-end investors with the same product, all of whom happened to be white men and couldn't understand the purpose of these hair extensions. And so they went home to their wives, who in the situation happened to also be white women, to ask if this was necessary, and they all went no. So without somebody at the table who understands or represents all these different diverse perceptions or experiences... We won't have stories or productions or products that are as diversely represented on screen and stage for audiences. Exactly. It, that is, there's nothing like lived experience to enhance understanding. Or understanding the value of something that is different or unexpected. And we see this with our own Indigenous population just not being given a voice at the table. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is just a no-brainer. You know, we have to have Indigenous voices at the table when we make decisions that concern them. And right now I'm just frustrated. It's like you say, you know, if people are making decisions about your community or about you and about your cohort, how are they going to make the right decision unless they hear from you? Just stop and listen. Unless you listen, you're not going to learn and, and the world isn't going to change. Uh, you know, I guess where I've been doing my gender advocacy I'm really grateful when I do feel that the men are honestly listening. You get a sense of which ones are honestly listening because they want to, they want to hear and they want to make change. And the ones who are just tolerating your presence as a box ticking exercise and just want things to go back to normal quickly. <laughs> 
Well, in some respects, there needs to be a degree of representation at every level in order for any change or normalization of diversity to be maintained. I mean, I've, I was really encouraged. I've been doing work with CM, so they're the um, International Council of Music Creators, and they are a kind of overarching umbrella organisation that bring together all the collection societies from around the world. And CM invited me to join their Gender Equity and Diversity Working Group in 2019, and so they brought me along to uh, quite a few high-level industry forums. Um, so I spoke to groups in Mexico City, in Tokyo, in Budapest. And they were largely groups of men, you know, the, the male leaders of these societies. I spoke to them about how you need to give women a voice in your boardrooms, at your decision-making tables, in your executive committees. I was really thrilled that, interestingly, two of the Asian societies, so the Indian Screen Music Society representative came up to me and said, do you know what, I have never thought about the low numbers of female screen composers in our industry, in Bollywood, you know, really lucrative industry. So here is a man of colour telling me, coming up to me and saying, we have shamefully low numbers of women in our industry, I'm going to do something about this. So this was in Tokyo in May last year. We saw each other again in Budapest in November and in that six-month period he had gone away. He'd reached out to the one kind of star female composer in Bollywood, set up a chapter in within the Screen Composers Guild equivalent, I guess. He had set up a, a female chapter and he'd invited 91 members who identified as female to join that chapter. So he, and he'd appointed a female chair of that chapter. So he'd really begun this fantastic networking initiative among female screen composers in India, and he'd done that in six months. And I just felt so grateful that he had opened up such strong pathways for women to mentor each other, to support each other, to grow together. And, and then they, I knew that they would then, in the same way that we have in Australia, make an impact on the Indian screen music industry, which is a very, very big one. And then the other leader of the Indonesian Music Society came to me and said, uh, we don't have any females on our executive. This is really bad. And I met him in Mexico City in November 2018 by the Tokyo meeting in June 2019, May, June 2019, he too had gone away and appointed a female chair and a female co-chair and another female board member to the Indonesian APRA equivalent from zero women. Suddenly we had three women on the executive in Indonesia. And I thought it was really interesting that the, you know, sort of not first world European white kind of countries were the quickest to hear what the message that I was bringing. One thing I was able to do with CM though that I was quite proud of in the 12 months that I worked with them was um, I convinced them to go and try, they were having their executive council uh, elections in November in Budapest with the support of the president, Eddie Schwartz, and the others on the executive council. We asked every collection society to nominate women if they could, you know, to identify potential leaders and ask the women to nominate for election onto the CM executive council. And from that, we got two women stepping forward. They were unanimously elected onto the executive council. We went from one out of 12 to two out of 12 in the 12 months that I was there. I just had a lot of really productive conversations with men who hadn't thought about this as an issue. It wasn't on their radar. Of course, I got pushback. I got men that didn't want to change up the status quo. They were quite happy with it. Thank you very much. That was the interesting thing, the difference between the men that really, really took on board the message and understood that it was about inequity, you know, that it was about social inclusion and social justice. Well, I think we're heading towards the right direction. Just having these conversations and broadening them uh, at every level in this industry is going to start some change. And you can't address systemic inequality without syst like systematically addressing or diversifying representation either through who they employ at the higher level or the composers and creators they choose to put on stage. That's so right. And that's essentially what it's about, isn't it? It's about naming it as systemic, naming these inequities as systemically generated, naming exclusion as a power-based dynamic. 
so it doesn't really matter whether the power is is racial or gender based or whatever. It, it's about questioning power. It, it's about letting in up underrepresented groups, whatever their shape, whatever their size. Once you apply that general approach, you can adapt it to to whatever is needed to open things out and to open out the discussion. And to recognise that diversification isn't a threat. Looking at it as it's about our relationships, it's about our mental health, it's about a sustainable future, it's about best practice, it's about social justice. And when you step back and you come from that place, as a white woman, I'm open to Indigenous voices, I'm open to racially diverse voices, I'm open to non- non-binary voices. It's like if you if you come from that place of let's open this out and let's share the love and let and let's create art and music that sounds and looks more like the world that we live in, you're on the right path, I think. And so that's what I've learned is not to be defensive, not to be turfy, not to play the exclusion game in my turn. And then I think you have these really productive conversations and you learn so much. And then you can question yourself without without defence and without fear because part of the journey is that we're questioning ourselves and it can be scary. It can be scary to be to be challenged, you know, and to have your privilege called out. But if you put social justice front and centre, it makes it, it just makes it easier because it makes it not about you. It's about raising up the next group and the next generation. Exactly. And it's about raising up, as you say, the next group and the next generation of creators and musicians and women in these roles. So I really want to say a huge thank you to you for talking with me about the nuances of your advocacy and your experience as a composer. It's been really thought-provoking and extremely helpful for me, as well as I'm sure many others who are listening right now. You're really welcome. It's been an absolute pleasure and I love what you're doing. I think it's a really great program you've got for the podcast and um, yeah, keep the conversations going. So once more, thank you so much, Felicity, for having this really important conversation about female representation in the music industry. Thank you, Vicky. On some other notes for our listeners, everything that Felicity and I have spoken about from stats, articles, reports and initiatives will be provided in the podcast description and transcript so you can have access to all the resources. Felicity also has a book that's being published very soon through Routledge called Women's Music for Diverse Narratives and Sound. It's definitely something I myself will be looking forward to reading when it's published. Thank you so much to anyone who is listening and catch you all next week with some more Declassify.